Israel. If you're joining us on uh, Facebook, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're just finishing some family talking here together uh, uh, about the church. If you really want to get the whole show, you got to come down here to Bowtell Street. I mean, that's it. We have things in the beginning. We have things. The Spirit moves and shares things with us. And then we come to the time for the message. So there's, there's things that you, you may miss. Uh, Jordan, would you come up here for a minute, please? Part, part of our commitment to Israel, and the reason we're committed to Israel is the Bible says to be. The Bible's very clear. Those nations that bless Israel will be blessed. Those who do not bless Israel will be under a curse. Now, you can have a, a screwed up theology that says otherwise, but this is what the Bible says. And as a congregation, we've been very, very faithful in our commitment in many ways uh, to Israel. Uh, in terms of mission giving, uh, tens of thousands of dollars have come out of this congregation uh, to support communities in the Shamron, uh, to support feeding programs in Israel, uh, to support summer camps for Israeli children uh, with Kabad, I mean, on and on and on, uh, plus our high involvement in Kufi Christians United for Israel. And Jordan is our uh, congregational representative to uh, Christians United for Israel. She's also Kufi's, Christian United for Israel's representative to our con congressional district. So she's our representative to Kufi, but she's Kufi's representative uh, to Lori Trahan, right? And uh, so we have a direct connection that way. Uh, we, we've been tremendously blessed. And whenever we, we see new connections opening up uh, there to be celebrated. And we have a new connection that's going to open up next week, Divine Moed Appointment. Whether it's Moshe Kapensky in the Cardo, uh, Udi Mariotz, who's done all our paintings for us in the church here, uh, whether it's Moshe Ben Baruch, who's been our guide for our last three tours, uh, we, we have connections. And whether it's Sandra Barris uh, from Christian friends of Israeli communities, uh, we have these connections. And, and doors are open and we have uh, a word and a lifestyle that we impart into Israel as well as what we receive. Well, we're about to open another one. And it's with Hayavel. I think most of you know about Hayavel. They started with Tommy Waller and his family just wanting to go help bring in the crops the grape crops in the beginning for uh, uh, the Israeli farmers who couldn't get that done uh, in the Shamron. And it's grown and grown and grown and grown until now. Uh, some people go over there for two week stints, some go for uh, as much as, what is it, two months? Three months. Wow, I won't get jealous. Uh, th three months in Israel working with the farmers. A tremendous thing. I mean, it, economically, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that would be lost if Christians were not volunteering to do this. And so on Tuesday night, Jordan is flying out to Israel and going to be spending two weeks with uh, Hayabel. Uh, a, a great organization. A, uh, they love the Lord. Uh, they think a lot like we think. As, as I've met with them, there's a you know, when I say met with them, we, we had them here one time, and, and what I followed on the internet, uh, you know, they're uh, Messianic Christians pretty much like we are, you know, have a, an above-board lifestyle. I mean, you, you, you won't find uh, worldly people there. You're going to find young people who understand what commitment to Yahweh means. And so Jordan's going to be going there and uh, spending two weeks. And when she gets back, she's going to have a lot to share with us, I'm sure. Um, but she's not just going on a trip for herself. We're sending her. This isn't Jordan said, I'd like to do this and jump on a plane and go over there. This, this is, this is a, a, a moed. This is a moed. This is establishing a, a connection. I don't know where the connection's going to go, uh, but he knows. And uh, I've, been, I've been wanting to make this connection for years because, uh, you know, there's a heart in the Wallers that, that comes very close to what our heart is. And uh, they need to know we have that heart and Jordan's got to go and 
pick up some of what they've got. Amen? Amen. So we don't send anybody out without our blessing and without praying for them. I want you to stand your feet, Jordan. Would you come stand over here? Donna, would you come up here? Extend your hands towards her. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we release blessing in Jordan's life right now. Blessings to travel. All her travel connections will be on time and accurate. It will be a safe trip. We bind all that would come against hindering that trip in any way at all. When she arrives in Israel, everything will work smoothly. And when she arrives at the place of labor, her everything she puts her hand to will prosper. Every word that comes out of her mouth will be an edifying word that edifies and builds up and establishes all the workers around her. She will be a blessing. She will carry all of the anointing of this congregation to bless your people. And there will be amazement among both the, the Israelis and among those who've come from America to work there at the anointing that rests on her. It will be released into a, a, a whole position that rises her up and not to glorify her, but Abba will release what a love for Israel means. We bless her in Yeshua's name and all of God's people in agreement said amen, amen and amen. Glory to God. Well, I'm sure glad that you and the, and the uh, internet family could uh, can join us uh, for that. Glory to God. Well, we're still in the midst, in the midst of Sukkot. Yes. And uh, every night we've been having uh, meetings in the Sukkot till the winds came and everything, and then we meet in, in here. We didn't have one last night because it was our Shabbat evening meals, but it's still that day of Sukkot right now. And I'm going to pick up on a, on a lesson that Jordan was teaching. You know, every, everyone that spoke so far this week had something to impart. I mean, there was something in there somewhere. You've got to look for it. You've got to expect it and look for it. And I expect and look for it. And I find it. Uh, but Jordan had shared something that went off in me. And, and I, again, I, I had another sermon in mind. Remember last week? I, I had a sermon to preach, but it got put aside. Well, that sermon's still put aside. So I, I don't know when that sermon's ever going to come by because... Um, uh, you know, this, this has been kind of burning in me since I heard that, uh, and so I, I want to share it with you, and, and, and my question to start off is this, why are you here? <laughs> why are you here? Now, I don't mean here as in church. That might have many reasons, but why are you here in life? <laughs> have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I? Why am I here on this planet? Why am I here in life? You know, what, what's my life about? Why? Why, why? why me? Are you simply the result of an unplanned pregnancy? Or the result of some evolutionary random sequence of events? Boy, that's a pretty hopeless place to be. Well, you know, I mean, amoebas started swimming around. Next thing you know, here am I. Well, great. On your evolutionary journey through ho-ho land. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, and, and people will say, I'm unwanted. Well, that's because you got your eyes in the wrong place. <laughs> unwanted doesn't exist in God's world. That doesn't exist in God's world. There is no such thing as unwanted. The question is one of purpose. Or is there a purpose for you? Not for life, for you. Is there a purpose for you? Was there a purpose for you being born? Is there a purpose for you still being alive right now in this year? Is there a purpose for you living in the United States of America? More importantly, if you're here, is there a purpose for, for you being in this congregation in Fitchburg, Massachusetts? Is there a purpose bigger than you can imagine? A purpose far beyond the circumstances of your life's experience. Don't look to your life's experience for your purpose. Amen. Come on. What your life has been, the ups and downs of it, the, the good things and the failures of it. If you're going to look there for your purpose, you're looking in the wrong place. What we need to understand is we are in a generation. We are in a culture that has lost its purpose. And a life without understanding purpose can end up in depression and even in suicide. 
The rate of suicide among young people is staggering. We are a generation of young people that have more material things than any previous generation ever. Electronic gadgets, smartphones, the ability to communicate around the world, and yet the suicide rate among young people is higher than it's ever been in the history of this country, which simply proves having material success does not mean you have purpose. Absolutely amazing within the ministry. I think I heard Billy Brim talking about this when I was walking through the room yesterday, but, but even within the ministry to find leaders in churches who commit suicide. What is wrong? What is wrong? You're serving God. You're, you're in a, a position of success. You've written, written a book and people like to read your book, but you commit suicide. That only happens if you have a life without purpose, if you've lost your purpose. How is it that men who have been you know, world famous comedians who can make people laugh apparently can't laugh themselves right. and commit suicide. What's going on inside that man that he can entertain us and cause us all to laugh and smile at us when he's doing it, but once he leaves the stage and goes to his home, something is wrong. Something is terribly wrong. And we might say that man has a purpose to entertain and bring joy to people, but that man was a man without purpose. When you have a purpose, you don't end your life. You fulfill your life. Amen. Come on. Amen. And to find out that in the church of the Lord Yeshua, that the vast majority of people struggle with depression at least several times a year, what happened to purpose? I looked up some purpose sayings. Isn't that a good thing to do these days? Find a purpose in life so big it will challenge every capacity of you to be at your best. Amen. I, need a, I, I need a purpose so big that it's going to challenge me that I'm going to have to be at my best. Amen. The purpose of life is not to be happy but to matter to be productive, to be useful, to have it make some difference that you lived at all. That's why I believe in doing everything possible to get people off welfare, especially men. A man who isn't working, assuming he's capable of working, his life doesn't have a purpose. The Bible says so. The Bible says so. A life without productivity is an end zone game. The end of it is zero. If you don't have a purpose to fulfill your life, glory to God. Here's another one. This is by John Maxwell who talks a lot about success. Success is knowing your purpose in life, growing to reach your maximum potential, and sowing seeds that benefit others. Success isn't that you got money. Success isn't that you're finally the CEO of the, co of the company. Success is not that you've won the lottery. Success is not that you're finally married. Success is that you know your purpose. Because if you do not have purpose, you will look to the wrong things to give you purpose. No spouse will ever give you purpose. No job will ever give you purpose. The job will come to a day when it's over. You retire and they go on as if you'd never been there. Or the job comes to a point where the company folds and you no longer have that job. A job can never give you your purpose. A marriage can never give you your purpose. Don't lay that on your husband or wife that you've got to give me my purpose in life. Your children cannot be your purpose. They will grow up and leave home. And then what do you do? Glory to God. Success is knowing your purpose. A janitor in a high-rise building who goes there every year to make not a, a really great wage but knows what his purpose in, is in life and knows that his purpose far exceeds the job that he has. Amen. Amen. The job has nothing to do with your purpose. But who knows he has purpose is going to be a truly happy person. Amen. 
Here's another one. When you walk in purpose, you collide with destiny. Oh, I like that one. If you walk in your purpose, you're going to collide with your destiny. If you have a strong purpose in life, you don't have to be pushed. Your passion is going to drive you there. Here's another one by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl became a, a, a psychologist, but he went through the Holocaust. He lived through those concentration camps and made it out the other side. And Viktor Frankl wrote this, Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. That puts me to shame any time that I, I would think that circumstances in my life are difficult. I don't know what difficult is compared to a man that went through the Holocaust. And he says, life is not made unbearable by circumstances. Get off it. It is made because you haven't found a meaning and a purpose. Albert Schweitzer, brilliant man who gave up a career he could have had <clears throat> both in music and in science, instead went to Africa to work in missions. And he said, the purpose of human life is to serve and to show compassion and the will to help others. It's not about you. Amen. And as long as you think it's about you, and as long as you're concerned about my this, my that, my rights, my this, as long as you live that, you do not have a purpose that will fulfill your life. Amen. Glory to God. Well, that'll get us started, I think. <laughs> Let's see if we can find some purpose that we can hang on ourselves and begin to refocus our lives and live. Let's, let's go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. <clears throat> then Yahweh said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Notice that nowhere in there did he ever say, rule over your fellow man. Come on. Nowhere did he say, <clears throat> men should rule over women. Women should rule over men. Parents should rule over children. Now hang in there with me. I'm not talking about a, a lack of authority. <clears throat> but ruling over means dominion. It means dominion. In fact, if we look at that in other translations, the Amplified says this, let them have complete authority, let them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over all the earth. Wow. Talk about a purpose for your life. When you come into the kingdom of God, God says, I have a purpose for you. It is called dominion, ruling, and complete authority. Your purpose in life, wherever you are, see it has nothing to do with job, has nothing to do with education, has nothing to do with circumstances. Mm -hmm. It is that as a child of the living God, wherever you are, you have a purpose. My purpose is to have dominion to dominate over the circumstances around me. My purpose is to rule over the circumstances. So Viktor Frankl found out that in the concentration camps, there were men and women who from within them had a dominating spirit over the horror of what was going on. Men and women who ruled over it refused to bow the knee of their heart to the horror that was happening. Horror unexplainable, but they came out still with a strong faith in God while others threw it all out because the circumstances overruled any purpose they had in their life. The men and women who made it through that, that had great faith in God had a purpose. And because they had a purpose, they were able to dominate even the evil. My, my, my. I think of that man in Russia, that pastor in Russia who was incarcerated and, and tortured for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. 
wanting him to reveal where the underground church was, he refused. But every time he was tortured, every time he was beaten, every time the guards mistreated him, he always spoke the love of Christ to them. He always witnessed to them that God loves you no matter what you've done. And one time he was brought into a, a, a senior man's office and revealing his record and the man said, we can kill you, we can this. And all this pastor kept doing, Pastor Wormberg, all he kept doing was speaking back the love of, of Christ. And finally the man said, how can you speak that way to me for all we've done? And he says, because of what my Savior has done for me and what my Savior wants to do for you. And the man just stared at him and tears came down his eyes. He took out a paper and he signed it and took it in with a bunch of papers to have the commandant of the prison sign. The commandant just is signing all the papers and one of them was the release for Pastor Wormberg. Walked out of there totally free because he dominated over that system. He triumphed. He ruled over those who had the power to destroy bodies. Talk about purpose, my God. We're talking about moving from here to there. And there, whether you know it or not, is a place of rulership. Some of you might have started in January with us and thought, well, I'm going to move from here to there. I'm going to move from not having enough money to have money overflowing. If you don't have purpose and you suddenly came into money overflowing, you're in trouble. Because you'll begin to look to the money to give you meaning. And then when the least about of that money starts falling away, you'll panic. You might be at a point where you have twice what you ever had before, but now you're panicking because you don't have five times what you had before. Here to there is, is not necessarily, well, here I've got a bad marriage, so at the end of the year I'm going to have a great marriage. Well, you should, but if, if you have a great marriage but you have no purpose, that great marriage can turn around overnight. <clears throat> Come on. We're going from here to there, and the there in your journey is a place of rulership where you are what the Bible says, the head, not the tail. Amen. That you walk into situations that are not pleasant, not fun, where people might not like you, but you got a smile on your face. Your head is high, your shoulders are back, because you don't work for them, you work for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Mr. Bosch, you might not like me, and I don't have this conversation with him personally, but I have it within me. Mr. Bosch, you may not like me, but I'm not working for you. I'm working for my Lord, and if he tells me it's time to leave here, I'm out. And if you fire me and it wasn't my time to leave, you created problems for yourself. Because I don't have problems because I never worked for you. I worked for the Lord. Come on. See, see, you dominate over that. You develop within you a sense of, you don't know who I am. That I have supernatural answers to things. Glory to God. Hallelujah. A purpose must be bigger than you. Until you find out that life is not about you, the remaining years till Yeshua returns are going to be challenging and difficult. And for many people in the body of Christ, it's year after year after year after year going around the same tree, trying and, and not successfully dealing with things that happened to you when you were a child. I, you know, this happened to me. Come on, when are you ever going to get over that? And so you finally come to a point where you're just hanging on, hoping to make it to heaven. That's where people get. You know, I always had a negative self-image. I always couldn't do this. I have this bad habit, and, and, and I can't control my mouth, and I do this, and I do that, and whatever I do doesn't seem to get ahead, and this is my life, and I'm trying, and I come to God, and, and I try, but I, I never seem to get ahead. You will come to a point in your life where either you walk away from the Christian faith altogether. You know, come on, I'm, 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 I'm trying to alert you, because... You know, it's like, that's what happens to people. I've been a pastor 50 years. They get to a point where rather than fix themselves, they blame the Bible. They blame God, so they walk away from that. Or they get to a point where they're just desperately hanging on. 
They're hanging on till they go. And they're hoping it'll be quick. Even now, Lord Yeshua, come. They don't want to go to Belize. They want to go to heaven. <laughs> come on. And, and, and that's, that's a, a terrible place because when you're in that place, yeah, your beliefs are right, but there's no joy in your life. And all of that is because you lost your purpose. You didn't know what your purpose was. It's not about you. It's not about whether you get a house or don't get a house, get ahead or don't get ahead, whether you get a car or don't get a car. It's, is there any purpose to my life beyond that? And I've worked with people who made far more money than I ever imagined that I would ever make. <laughs> and they got a brand new car every year and they get several homes and all that. But I talk with them and they have no purpose. Their purpose is money. And it's amazing. You know, they're in a position as a CEO demanding that they get paid 100000 more than what they're already getting paid, which is 700000 because they found another CEO who's doing a similar job. He gets paid 800000 And so based on what he gets paid, they want to get that paid too. Why? Not based on what the work is, not based, based on what they do. They've lost their sense of I'm doing something and my value is I'm a doer. And they put their value and purpose to be well paid and somebody comes along who's better paid come on it's not about you now I can't stop it from being about you I can just tell you 99% of all counseling issues in any psychiatrist's office pastor's office or counselor's office are because a person thinks it's all about them they think life is all about them you got to fix other people because, it, you know, they're hurting me. We go to the government, you gotta, you got to do it, government, because it's all about me. You need to take care of me. And until you change that and find a purpose, you're never going to get to there. Amen. I believe you want to get there. Amen. Come on. Amen. A culture that is all about you is a culture that falls apart. Is there not something bigger than you? Is there not something bigger in life than you? Come on. You know, many times people will join organizations, churches, and, and sports teams uh, because they want to be part of something that's bigger than you. I heard a college uh, uh, football player talking about deciding what college that he wanted to go to, and the issue was that he had several offers and one was a was a small college where he'd be the hero the other was a well-known football you know team college where it's questionable whether he'd even get off the bench and he talked about that but you know being on the football team in the small college you're never going to get a shot at getting off the bench in the big college and you're never going to be able to say in the business world, I went to this well-named college and they hire you because of your college, but they don't even know of the little college. And he was talking about his ego. I want to go to the college where everybody likes me, but that might last four years and then I have no future. What, what, what is your purpose? What is your purpose? Speaking of football, there's, there's a great fake out in that world. I mean, everybody starts at this level. Thousands and thousands of high school quarterbacks all think they're going to be Tom Brady. And you might be good, but how many quarterbacks are there in the league? I don't know, but there's, there's not much room at the top. It's, it's, it's very tight at the top. And you may make it, but what if you don't make it? Do you have a purpose? Do you know the football players that, that, I, that I have found that after they retire from football, tend to go on and do a lot of things and is just uh, my limited knowledge I'm not a great sports guy but are the football players who are in the fellowship of Christian athletes and you know why because they have a bigger purpose than football how can you be successful in football if, if that's not everything no they have a bigger purpose and the bigger purpose is Yeshua and these men delight in off season to go around and talk to high schools and youth groups and churches about who Yeshua is and what he means to him. Well, of course, they call him Jesus. 
what Jesus means to them. And, and I've heard them talk about that what Jesus means to them and them sharing that testimony and seeing young people give their life to Christ because they shared is bigger than anything they have ever done. I heard one say that from a team where they, he had a uh, Super Bowl ring and he said it's bigger than my Super Bowl ring. Super Bowl ring, that was great, a big hype, but with the, when I look over what, what gives my life meaning, the numbers of young people who have given their life to Jesus are going to spend eternity in heaven because of my testimony. That's the trophy that gives me meaning. That's my purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Wow. So God's going to work in people's lives, but only a certain kind of people. It's those who know that they're called according to his purpose. So right away, i got to know one thing. You know, I have a purpose. My father called me to be part of the family. you you got, you got a purpose when you're in the family of God. We're all adopted. None of us are natural born. He chose you. It's like the two boys were having a fight one day and, 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 and there was one was a natural born son, the other was an adopted son. And the natural born said to the adopted son something he should never have said, but he said, well, you know, he says, I'm a natural born son, you were adopted. To which the adopted boy said, yeah, mom and dad got stuck with you, but they chose me. Amen. Come on. Well, I got passed over for a promotion. Oh, come on. You won't believe the promotion I got. I got promoted from hell to heaven. Yes, yes indeed. And I'm worried about you didn't give me a promotion. Yes. Somebody else didn't deserve it. I got it. You got it. See, I just don't have my eyes in the right place. That's right. That's right. I got a promotion. Once I was lost, now I'm found. Glory to God. So we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Yahweh has a purpose for your life. Find it. We're going to find it today. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. If you're looking at that in Romans 8, 29. God predestined that we're to be conformed to the likeness of his son. What's your purpose? Why did he bring you into the family? Your first purpose is to look like Yeshua. To come to a point where you can say to somebody like Yeshua said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You can say, if you've seen me, you've seen Yeshua. If you watch what I do, you're seeing what Yeshua would do. That's, right. That's the purpose. I, I, I'm not going to say that any of us are there yet. We're working to there. We're going to get there. But it, it is a purpose that I'm to look like his son to walk into the throne room and the father looks out and says, uh, Yeshua, oh, Don, it's you. I, 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 you know, you look just like Yeshua. <laughs> Come on. I mean, get that picture in your mind. You walk in there, you know, and, you know, oh, hi, Yeshua. Oh, oh, my, it's you. <laughs> you look just like Yeshua. I, I, you know, you do that all the time. You walk in here and I think it's Yeshua. And I forgot, he's sitting on the throne over there. He couldn't, yeah, right. But you look like him, you know. You're the spitting image of Yeshua. Come on. There's a song that a, a group that used to sing in a church I had previously would sing, I have my father's eyes. I've got my father's eyes. I've got my father's eyes. Imagine if that just in, embedded in you, that, that when you're in public and you're talking with people and you look them in the eye and they look you in the eye and they go, You know, who are you? What? You know, your very eyes are the eyes of Yeshua. With that when they look at you, you're looking at them just like Yeshua would look at them. With compassion, with truth, with love. My, 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 my. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. In him we were also chosen. There it is again. You have a purpose, you're chosen. I was chosen for the team. Amen. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ 
might be for the praise of his glory. Amen. You and I have a purpose. And that is to exhibit his glory. Come on. There's not a lot of places where I, I agree with the historic Roman church. But in one of their catechisms was, what is the purpose of man? And the purpose of man is to bring glory to God. They got that right. That is your purpose. That is your purpose. To bring glory to God. There was an ad put out. You know, the, the, the Mormons put out some great ads. And again, not that I agree with Mormon theology. I don't. But why doesn't the evangelical church get on with it and do what the Mormon church does? Why don't we work like they do? Why don't our young people grow up giving a year of their life free to the church to go be missionaries for the church? Come on. Because most of the church is about me. And the Mormon church is trying to teach their young people it's not about you. They had an ad of this, this man, these businessmen running through an airport and they're running and one of them had said to the other, you know, we're going to miss our plane if we don't hurry. We've got to hurry. We've got to hurry. And as the one man's running, there's a little boy with a box of crayons and something and the businessman bangs into him and all the crayons go all over the floor. And he's running and, and he sees that and he turns and his friend is saying, come on, John, come on, we're going to miss our plane. John puts his briefcase down and he goes back and he gets on the floor and starts helping the little boy pick up his crayons. And at the end, the little boy looks in his face and says, are you God? Come on. That's the message wrapped up in one ad. Are you God? You must be God that you stepped out of your busy world to care for me, a child? Are, are you God? Can you help me across the street? Can you get out of your way? Can you give up your agenda for anybody else? Willingly and gladly looking for ways to do that? That wasn't in my notes. For the praise of his glory. What's the purpose of men? You can't find a bigger purpose. And when you get that purpose, paying a price is easy. Amen. Paying a price is easy. When you've got a purpose to pay it. You've got to be kidding me. Why would I, why would I not pay this price when, when I am absolutely convinced that my Lord, you know, will pay back sevenfold and beyond? When I, when I absolutely believe his word that what you do here is laying treasures in heaven. I am not building for this life. Because what I do and you do in the short period called life here is going to set a marker for all eternity. You'll be glad to be there, but you might be there with no crown. Because all your works are going to be put in fire. This is Bible. You're in heaven, but now all your works that you did as a Christian, even in a church that said, we don't believe in works, we just believe in grace. I got news for you. As a Christian, there's going to be a judgment that is not based for salvation, but it is based on e what's going to happen in eternity, and all your works are going to be put into a, a fire, and what is gold and silver will be will extract it, and what is wood, hay, and stubble, what has been about you and what you want to do with your life, and all the things you did or didn't do because you were concerned about you is absolutely consumed, gone for all eternity, but what you did because you were aware, I have a purpose in life. Life. And it's not me, it's I serve a God who loves me and I serve a God who loves all those people and it's counting on me to do something for them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I just don't want to be there. It's, 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 not, it's not a works thing to me, but I don't want to be there and find out I made a selfish choice. And great. It's gone now, and over there is somebody who had the same opportunity, and they gave up what they wanted to do something to be God in that situation. Are you God? Yes, I am. 
And to be God in that situation, and out comes gold and silver, which is now fashioned in a crown. Not so you can walk around heaven saying, look at my crown, but so that when it says in the Bible they cast their crowns before the Lamb, I've got something to cast before him. What's your purpose? It's got to be bigger than you. Amen. You, you, you're, you don't have enough in you to be a purpose to even go on living. No, I'm serious. Keep the change. Go home. <laughs> Come on. You know, the Bible talks about, well, a man lay, lay his life down for a friend. He says, well, a man might for a friend, but by and large, people aren't going to willingly lay their life down for people. But Yeshua laid his life down for us. How on earth can we not lay our life down for him? Amen. And it's a purpose. Keeps you going. Keeps you going. I told you, I think, last week, Pastor Shad and I talk about that. How many, now I'm 77, he's 88, I think. Why are, we still, why are we still doing what we're doing? How, how many of our colleagues are dead? How many of our colleagues retired and are just sitting to wait for life to end? I'm not bragging on us, but, but I've got a purpose. Amen. I, I've got a purpose to get in the pulpit. Yes, amen. I've got a purpose. And my purpose is bigger than my job. Right. What did Jordan call it? Uh, your purpose and your calling. Don't, don't confuse the two. We all have the same purpose. We have different callings. Amen. Well, what, what do you mean we all have the same purpose? Let me see if I can find it here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, make my joy complete, he's speaking to a church, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. You want to keep the Holy Spirit happy? You want to keep the Apostle Paul happy? Church on Bald Hill Street, make my joy complete, says Paul. Be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. He nowhere says be one in doctrine. Be one in our purpose. And our purpose is to live our life out for the Lord. Amen. It's not about us, it's about Him. Amen. And so that leads us then in our purpose to say, well, we find God's will right here. So I have a purpose to live my life to please Yahweh, so then I'm going to find out what pleases Yahweh here. And when the Bible says do something, I'm going to make every effort I can to understand it and to do it. Amen. But if my mind disagrees with it, Political correctness says it's something. Everybody around me says it's something different. I'm reading it. It's right there. It's very clear. Well, we don't believe that anymore. Well, then you and I don't have the same purpose. My purpose is to glorify my Lord. And my Lord believed every word on this Bible. How can I glorify him when I'm denying it? I mean, it, it's very simple. And, and I'm not saying what you can or cannot do. I'm just trying to share with you what the Bible says about purpose and what I found. That when I keep my eye on my purpose, I can get through everything that gets through. People say, that's easy for you to say, you're a pastor. Well, go be a pastor for a while. If pastoring is so good, why is it that over, over 100 pastors every week quit in America? Every Monday. Every Monday over, Monday's when it happens. Why? The day after Sunday. Their experience of Sunday was, I can't take it anymore, I'm leaving. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's Sunday and, and the deacons come up and tell you, you know, somebody's complaining about you and some person is always on your back about this, we don't like you. Or as one of my colleagues had, the trustees came up and said, we're going to do everything we can to see you're fired by the end of the month. This is the loving church. This is, you just preached your heart out, you preached a message and that's what you get back. 100. Leave. Every Monday, quit. Glory to God. You know, so when people say, well, that's easy. No, no, no. There's challenges wherever you are. Come on, of course there's challenges. But once you find, <laughs> if, once you find the purpose, it's got to be bigger than you. 
there's got to be something bigger than you. Amen. Come on. I remember when I was working in Digital Equipment Corporation, which saw itself as a competitor to IBM. Now that doesn't mean they were close to IBM, but they were closer to IBM than anyone else. So digital was viewed as the company that could grow to a point where it would take on IBM and they'd they be, be at that level with each other. Well, what a shock to those people who lived in the world of DEC all those years here in Massachusetts where it was the company to be part of, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden they get up one day and found out that a little upstart PC company called Compact had bought digital. Digital didn't have enough money to keep paying its own help and was in the middle of downsizing and a little PC company. And that's what it was looked like. This little PC company comes along and buys it. Hallelujah. Buys it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That, I mean, but that, you know, if, if I have a purpose in life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work at DEC all my life. Well, your purpose just got out the window. And as, as things would work out, all the people at Com Compact, of course, were very excited because their little upstart company, which was pretty big by that time, had bought digital. So when you walk down in Compact, there were all the people in Compact, you know, we're going to gobble up the computer world, we're going to be everything. And, you know, we, we were so big and brazen, we, we bought you and all this, and we're going to spend our life at, at, at Compact. And that's my purpose. And the purpose is, was exhibited when I'd go into the parking buildings down there. I'd travel down there once a month for a week. And boy, you'd, you'd get the, if I got there at 8 o'clock to get in the parking garage, it took me 20 minutes to find a slot. Everybody was there by 7.30, 7 o'clock. A lot of the engineers were there. And if I left at 5.30, 6 o'clock at night, you know, to go back to the hotel, I'd go out and I'd say, oh, gee, look at my watch. Is it right? Because the garage is still full. I mean, how do you get 10,000 employees in this area? Again, the garage is always full. Commitment, purpose. Until one day, all the employees of Compact woke, woke up, and the headline, nobody knew it was coming. Headlines in the, they found it in the morning newspaper. Oh. HP buys Compact. I mean, people were physically sick. Physically. People were physically sick. What I noticed is the week after that, I was down there. In less than one week, the sign compact was gone. Mm. HP was the big sign outside the building. Within less than a month, this is a huge campus. I mean, 14 buildings that are like eight stories tall. Within less than a month, all the carpeting was changed in the entire campus <laughs> to match the HP carpeting. And in less than a month, you were in a foreign world. Right. Glory to God. And what I noticed was very simple. I commented to the HR people, you gotta, you gotta think this through when you do these things. I got down there and I showed up at 8.30. There were very few cars in the garage. When I left at 5.30, the garage was almost empty. Why? People had no purpose anymore. I've got a purpose to be with this company and we're gonna go together and we're gonna make it and we're gonna make it and then the company decides, no, we're gonna do something else. And all the motivation, all the energy to say, yeah, I'll get there early and I'll work late because, you know, we're all, as a company, we're going somewhere. Now you put your purpose in the wrong place. Companies come and companies go. Glory to God. But the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord. <laughs> come on, but the word of the Lord abides forever. The word of the Lord abides for ever and ever and ever. So your purpose is to bring glory to your Father in heaven. So how do we do that? It's not just how you live, that's part of it. It's how you speak. You could look at 1 John 3, 8, and you'd find that John writes, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Well, if I want to be like my Lord, then my purpose is to destroy the devil's work. I want to be just like my older brother. Older brother Yeshua, what, 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 was, what was your purpose in coming? To destroy the devil's work. Well, what does that mean? That means anytime you see something the devil's done, your heart, your actions should do everything you can to destroy it. 
When you say that, most people think of healing maybe or something like that. No, no, what about error? What about correcting corruption? Come on, come on. How, am I doing Yeshua's work when somebody starts talking about something that is anti-God and I let them know that? Am I, am I destroying the devil's work if I get one person to change their mind about abortion? You better believe I'm doing. Yes. I, I'm doing it wherever I, when, whenever that issue comes up. I don't get quiet because then I'm not, I'm not glorifying God. Well, I glorify God by just being quiet and be, being a nice person. Nice people don't cut it. Yeshua wasn't a nice person. That's right. He confronted, he challenged anything that would destroy people. Amen. Anything that was against the word, he challenged yeah, it. Because how can people get out of darkness if light doesn't light up? Amen. Come on. So your purpose in life, it's about him. It's about glorifying him wherever I am. You know, I can, use that per I can use that voice anywhere. I could be a janitor and, 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 and sweeping the floor. And, and along comes an employee that I know, a manager or somebody, we get talking and, and he mentions something about abortion. I'm just the janitor, but I can say, well, you know, the Bible says that's a sin. The Bible says that's an abomination. I don't need to argue with them. I just need to put truth out. I'm, I'm giving glory to God. Or I could be the manager talking with the janitor. And the janitor says, yeah, well, you know, uh, I was just uh, voting for so-and-so. I can say, well, did you know that they're pro-choice? Pro they believe in abortion. Well, yeah, but no but about it. If you call yourself a Christian, yeah, well, you can't be a Christian and do that. That is totally against what, everything that God says. You've been lied to. See, is that doing the work of God or not? Yes. It's going to come down to the fact that, that oh, the, the greater purpose is to be God's agent. Well, then guess what? I'm God's agent. I like what um, Scott said last night at, at the sukkah service. There was a lot of things he said I like, but, but uh, when he was talking about the evangelist who comes in, and he preaches the message and everybody gets stirs up and he says, but I'm an evangelist. I'm going to leave next day, go to the other church and let the pastor fix it. That's kind of a joke among pastors. And yeah, the evangelist comes in and raises all these doctrinal things and says these things and walks out and next thing you know, I got people saying, well, is that what you believe? I didn't think you believed that. And you know, it's, no, we can disturb people's lives. There was a bishop in the Episcopal church that said one day he was reading the Bible and he realized that where every, everywhere Paul went, everywhere the Apostle Paul went, there was a riot. And he says, and I looked over my life everywhere I go, they serve me tea. <laughs> Come on. They serve me tea. Glory to God. Amen. So let's wrap this up by saying that one of the things uh, in terms of how we give glory to God is with our tongue. Listen to this from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Well, he knew you, Christian, before he formed you in the womb. By the way, this is a good pro-life yes. message right there. Before he, he, form, he, formed, he formed you, before he formed you in the womb, he already knew you. That's right. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's not purpose, by the way. This is calling at this point. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I'm with you and I will rescue you. Think about that. Jeremiah says, I want to sell out. I'm, I'm, here I am, God. Use me. I'm going, to, I'm going to serve you. And he says, great. I want you to go speak to people. Well, I can't speak very well. Well, d don't be concerned about that because I'm going to be with you. I'm fine with it up to then. Tell this next little phrase. <laughs> and I will rescue you. Uh, rescue me? Uh, you, 
you, you tell me to go speak, and then you say, don't be concerned, I'll rescue you. Uh, what are you going to tell me to say that is going to require I get, that I need to be rescued? Uh, can, can we get some more details before I sign on the dotted line? You know, that, you know, you go tell them what I will. Don't be afraid, I'll be with you, and I'm going to rescue you. Uh, um, I don't sign up for a job that requires rescuing. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 17 and 19 in Jeremiah 1. Here's what God says to Jeremiah. Get yourself ready. Oh, my. Oh, oh Abba, can, give, me, give, give me time to think about it. No, no, get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests and people in the land. They will fight against you but will not overcome you, for I am with you. And again he says, I'll rescue you. I thought I was going to speak in a neighborhood Bible study. What's this kings and priests and Levites and religious leaders? <laughs> Listen to this in the Message Bible. We're just about done with this. This is, this is what God says. Before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. But I said, but I said, Jeremiah is speaking, hold it, Master God. Look at me. I don't know anything. I'm only a boy. God told me, don't say I'm only a boy. I'll tell you where to go and you'll go there. I'll tell you what to say, and you'll say it. Don't be afraid of a soul. I'll be right there looking after you, God's decree. But you. See, so he gets off the people and where you're going to speak. He gets back to Jeremiah. Do you have a pro you have a purpose. You've got to get on with it. But you, up on your feet, get dressed for work. Stand up and say your piece. all he's asking you to do. Say your peace. He's not asking you to convince him and argue with him and beat with him and fight with him. But when somebody says something, Holy Spirit witnesses, say this. Say that's not right. Say I disagree with that. Or more importantly, say that Bible doesn't say that. And then close your mouth. Just say your peace. But he can't get his church to say their peace. Come on. I'm talking about purpose. Amen. I'll tell you what to say and you'll say it. Don't be afraid of a soul. I'll be right there. But you, get up on your feet. Get dressed for work. Stand up and say your piece. Say exactly what I tell you to say. Don't pull your punches or I'll pull you out of the lineup. Hallelujah. Sitting on the bench. Stand at attention while I prepare you for your work. Man, I was reading that this morning and, and I said, Holy Spirit said, look it up in the message. So I did. Stand at attention while I prepare you for your work. Hallelujah. Don't slouch around. That's right. Stand up. Yes, sir. Reporting for duty, sir. Stand, Stand at attention while I prepare your work. I'm making you as impregnable as a castle, immovable as a steel post, solid as a concrete block wall. You're a one-man defense system against the culture. You're a one-man defense system against the culture. You may be the only voice in your family they'll ever hear about what the Word of God says. You'll be the only one maybe in your family to confront that they've adopted a culture that is ungodly. That's right. And if you don't speak, who's going to? Come on. Stand at attention. You're going to be solid as a concrete wall. You're a one-man defense system or a one-lady defense system yes. against this culture. Your voice, if you don't speak it, who's going to speak it? Come on. Don't, don't let loudmouth people intimidate you. There are things going on in our culture that if you don't speak and I don't speak, well, well I can't change every, you're not even changing one because you won't speak it. And when you speak it, you're going to give glory to God because you've identified yourself. Look, I don't have all the answers. I just know what God says. And I am committed to do what God says. Amen. 
against Judah's kings and princes, against the priests and local leaders. They'll fight you, but they won't even scratch you. I'll back you up every inch of the way, God's decree. Now, last verse. Boy, I'm right on time. I'm doing good. I really do. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we all know it. Yeshua came to them after the resurrection and he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you, always, to the very end of the age, teaching them to obey what he's commanded. Number one, if we don't receive the word as a commandment, then we can't teach it as a commandment. But if we're doing the word, we've also got to teach the word. People don't know. I remember years ago when I was uh, in college, and I had a roommate as a freshman. He, he wasn't a believer, and I was. And I was part of a little group. It was an all-men's college, probably 2,500 men, maybe 3,000. There was a group of maybe 10 Christians on that entire campus. And uh, so we get together and kind of moan about the fact of living in a pagan culture. And uh, Hunter was a very nice guy. He was my roommate. And, uh, but, you know, Hunter was sophisticated. Hunter, you know, went to prep schools and private schools and came to college as a freshman driving a brand new Mercedes 300 SL. You know, and I'm, who am I? You know, I'm just a little army officer's son. And uh, see, I didn't know who I was. <laughs> And, and I can remember one time reading my Bible and kind of drifted off to sleep. And while I was sleeping, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was in heaven. And Yeshua was standing there. And it was near this big gate like the gate to heaven. I don't know if I had just gotten there or that particular day I happened to be there. But there was Yeshua. And so I'm, I'm kind of watching what he's doing and everything, and he kind of looks at me and acknowledges that I'm there, and so I'm just kind of standing there, and people are coming through the gate, and all of a sudden, Hunter comes through the gate. And Yeshua said, who are you? And he said, well, I I'm Hunter. And he said, your name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He says, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry but you can't come in. And as I stood there in, 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 the, in the vision, Hunter began to fade away, like an image just drifting away. And all he was saying was, Don, you didn't tell me. Don, you didn't tell me. And I looked at Yeshua, and he looked at me with tears running down his cheek. I called him Lord, but I wouldn't even tell my roommate that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. I'll never forget that look of disappointment. I hope I never see it again. Yeshua loves me. I'm going to be in heaven. Sins are removed as far as east from west. He's not ever looking me and going to say, oh, yeah, 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 I remember you. You're the one that wouldn't tell your roommate. No, he doesn't remember that. But that look of disappointment. Don, why didn't you at least tell him? You didn't need to make him a Christian, but he didn't even have the choice because you didn't tell him. My, 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 my. And so Yeshua's command is that we're, we're to be him in the world. What would Yeshua do? Would he pray for the person? Would he speak to the person? Would he help the person? Would he go out of his way? You know, I, 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 Holy Spirit brings things from me as illustrations I don't like to use because I, I really don't like to talk about things I do. But I, I'm so aware that we are lacking practical teaching. You know, that people don't extrapolate from say, oh, okay, it means this, it means this. And, and there's things I do, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's like you have a split second to answer Holy Spirit. 
I, I don't know if I, I shared this with you, but I was in the nursing home visiting somebody, the rehab, and uh, a man came and he went out in the parking lot and he greeted the, the, the receptionist there and she obviously knew him, so I don't know how long he was, has been going there. His wife is in there. And so while I'm signing out of the, of the registry, he comes back in and he says to the receptionist, I, I locked my keys in my car. And so I'm listening to this conversation, and she said, well, do you have another set? And he said, well, I have another set at home. But I don't know how I'm going to get there. And right away, <laughs> I didn't hear that, Lord. Just walk away. Come on. I, I mean, I've done that in my life. I'm not saying I haven't. But it's like, but that's the choice. So I'm standing there having this well, Holy Spirit, do you want me to take you? <laughs> what a dumb question. Do you want me? Well, of course he wants you to. Do you want me to? Do you want me to? I, I've got something I'm supposed to be doing, and do you want me to take him to wherever he lives? I don't know where he lives to get his, you know, why even ask the question? You know, I knew what Holy Spirit was saying. I said, uh, listen, sir, I, I, I'd be glad to give you a ride to your house to get your keys. Oh, that would be great. He was an older gentleman. That would, I need to be careful. You know, I'm calling people older gentlemen who are actually younger than younger me. Than you. <laughs> Get with it, Donald. Yes, but you know. I am younger. You are younger. So, so I, I got him in the car, and we start down the driveway, and I says, so where do you live? He lives in, in Lemonster. Whoa. You know, right away the devil's, oh, hi, you're going to have to drive all the way to Lemonster. He's probably on the clear other side of Lemonster, too, you know. <laughs> it's like, don't even try it, devil. I've already made my commitment. You know, what was, it, what was a man going to do? Well, God, would you send him an angel? I did, it's you. <laughs> I, I, I arranged it perfectly. He came, you were there. I mean, I thought I did a good job. You know, the, the, I got my angel right there. It's you. So we, we get all the way over there, and I'm sitting in the thing, and, and he says, uh, he comes back. He had to get a key from the, the, from the apartment complex that was there to get him in. The, he couldn't find the key. So we're driving back. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, okay, so I'm headed back, and, and he said, well, what am I going to do? I said, well, you know, you can get a, a garage, you can probably get into your car or something like that, uh, you know. And, and all of a sudden, Holy Spirit says, when are you going to ask me? And I realized, I said I'd do it, but I never asked him how to do it. The man lost his keys. I'm going to take him home. And he, the man defined what we were going to do. Not Holy Spirit, man defined. I got him at home. So I'm now going in with the man defined. I never asked Holy Spirit, and how should I do this? I mean, come on, I'm smart. I got a brain. You get in your car and drive him over there and get it. Holy Spirit, you said, said to me, when are you going to ask me? And in a minute, I said, forgive me, Holy Spirit. He said, call Scott. Scott Rhodes. Scott Rhodes. Well, why didn't I think of that before? Scott, do you know how to get in a car? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask him what he did in his former life. <laughs> I said, I, I got, a, I got a, 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 you know, a, a close friend of mine who will come over and do that. So, so and, and I mean, boop, five minutes, and he's got his keys. And, and, and I didn't take that long. Didn't take that long. No, didn't even take that long. And, 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 and you know, so when I'm driving away, I'm, I'm reviewing. You've got to review when you do things. I mean, I did a good thing. I helped the man. But, but why did I drive all the way to Lemonster, all the way back, when I could have called him in before I would have even been out of Fitchburg? He would have been there. You know, it's like, why, why didn't I do that? And the Holy Spirit's answer was, why didn't you do that? Even in your serving. <laughs> See, even your serving. It's much better to do it his way. God, do you want me to say something or no? No, this is a place to just close your mouth. Oh, okay. okay, Father, someone else will take it. No, I, want to, I don't want to take care of it. This is somebody else. I'll, I'll help somebody else. I'm not going to help that person. No. You see, we're to glorify God. And I, you know, what does that man know? All he knows is two angels showed up. Doesn't know who we are. You know, got his car, and I'm sure he's out there. You know, weirdest thing. You know, my car, this this guy drives me to, and then and then this other guy shows up, and 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 then they disappear. 
There is a God. There is a God. Okay? There is a God. And so I, I want you to refocus what your purpose is. What is your purpose? What's your, well, I'm a mom. That's not a good enough purpose. Mom wears thin sometimes. Dad, well, dad wears thin sometimes. I don't want to be a dad. Well, you are a dad. Well, I don't want to be one. You know, well, you are a dad. <laughs> come on, come on. You know, what's your purpose? Well, I, I work at such and such. No, no, no. That's what you're called to do with your purpose. My purpose goes with me wherever I go. When I'm shopping, my purpose is with me. When I'm fixing something, my purpose is with me. Come on. When, when, you know, when, when, whenever I've got this job or that, it doesn't make any difference. You know, we need you to do this. God says, look, I want you to go someplace and I want you to work in, in their post office in this, in this ministry for, for a year. If, if that's where you want me, that's where I go. But that's not my purpose. See, serving God isn't your purpose. Reflecting him is. Bringing glory to him is. Hmm? And it could be even in your home. That's the biggest one. In your own home. Am I giving glory to God? Am I causing the glory of God to come with me? That's your purpose. That's your purpose. At, at the end of life, Jordan's made a comment. Let me share this and then I'll close. Jordan, Jordan made a comment the other day. She was running off the, this, the, the DVD for, uh, or the, the tape for um, FATV for the broadcast. And I heard her say to Donna, we've got over 400 now. It's like over 400 what? Over 400 separate sermons have been compiled to be either on YouTube or on the uh, on you know TV thing. 400. 400. 400. 400. It's like Yahweh. Why do I feel like I've got 800 in me yet to come out? <laughs> it's, an, it's an endless stream. Because there's purpose. There's a purpose. Ed Dufresne uh, was a pastor. He studied under uh, Kenneth Hagin for a while. Ed and Nancy Dufresne had a church in, uh, uh, in California. And Ed went home to be with the Lord uh, last year, I think it was, or was it? Is it 13, 2013. 2013, that long ago? Oh my goodness. I am enjoying life so much, it's going like a jet. And uh, yeah, the devil stole, it's clearly. And didn't like what he was doing and everything, and, and he left. But, but Nancy tells his story that, they, that uh, he, he traveled a lot, so he wasn't in his local church very often. And they would look at the calendar and plan ahead, so they had picked a date and said, Ed is preaching on this particular Sunday. And uh, he had been traveling for several weeks in a row, and he gets home, and that Sunday morning, uh, he gets up, and he says to her, I, I am just beat. I am just, I, you're going to have to preach today. And Nancy looked at him and says, no, sir. And she called him, sir. No, sir. We told the people that you were going to be in that pulpit preaching today, and it's been a long time, and they've been waiting for you. And you know, as well as I do, the anointing will get on you when you're in the pulpit. And tired will go once you get in the pulpit. And you're going to get in there, and you are going to preach. That was the last sermon he gave in that church. What if he hadn't given it? What if there was a message that because he was tired, you know, he wasn't going to give it, but he had a purpose in life. And that's what Nancy called on. So, oh, she was mean. No, no, no. She was calling him to his purpose. She was saying, Ed, remember your purpose. Remember your purpose, Ed. You got a purpose. All of us need someone in our life who can call us to our purpose. Remember your purpose. You're bigger than this. You're better than this. Don't let the devil see you sweat. Stand up. Put your shoulders back. As he said here, 
get dressed, get ready to go to work, stand at attention, I'm going to give you your assignment. We need to be surrounded by people who will encourage us in our purpose. Please, please. Please don't do it alone. Because you can't. You were never designed to be alone. Yeshua never sent the disciples out alone. He sent them two by two by two. Find someone that can be, that will come alongside you and remind you of your purpose and call you to go at it again. Well, I tried again, but go at it again. I believe in you. Who's going to speak purpose into your life? When the devil can separate people so that we're all together, we're having fun, but then we go into our lonely little worlds, we're defeated. We're defeated. Well, guess what? You got me in your life. And you got Donna in your life. <laughs> and we're going to speak. We're going to speak. I told Pastor Shad, you know, he and I are going to stay in the saddle till the saddle ain't there. Come on. Till the last assignment is over. Till Yeshua comes. I think he's coming in now. Amen? You've got a purpose. And, and let's say it's, it's five years, ten years, twenty years even. You know, who, who cares? What are you going to do with the next twenty years? That's what matters. That's what's matter. You know, you still have purpose. You still have a reason. It's not the job you had. They've gone on without you. <laughs> it's not many of the friends you've had. Many of them have gone on without you. Huh? What's your purpose? Yahweh, why am I here? It's where we started. Why are you here? Why are you, Christian? Why are you in October of the year 2019? Why are you still alive? Why are you living in Fitchburg or whatever town around here you do? Or if you're watching on, the, on Facebook, wherever you are, why are you here? It's not an accident. Yahweh's not, just got us in a holding pattern. Well, your date hasn't showed up yet, so uh, just keep circling. No, no. No, 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 no. He's got a purpose for your life. And we all need to be able to say to the devil, we're going to go out of here with a blaze, devil. <laughs> we're going to go out of here with a smile, devil. We're going to go out saying, I've run my race, I've completed, I've done everything that I've been told to do. Hmm? Not because... Oh, I want to stay here, but I want to serve him. I want to please him. And I want to see what other surprises he's got. And I want to see what moeds he's got for me. Where I bump into somebody and we strike up a conversation and the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit's beginning to say words to that person through me. And you go, wow, Abba, that's great. If it's okay for you, I'd like to sign up for a few more years of that. Come on. What's your purpose? God says he has a great purpose for you. Yes, he does. Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us. Thank you for uh, the purpose that you bring to our life that is so much bigger than what we could do. So much bigger than what we could do. So, Father, we give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get ready to receive our offering before we close today. Jay, were you able to get that uh, YouTube thing up? Uh, while you're getting your offering ready, I want you to see this.
Praise Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can. Uh, Thank you, Lord. That's the truth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to he is the way maker. Yes, He is. That is a. Even when we don't see. That is a Pentecostal church in uh, Louisiana. I think it's called the Pentecostals of, of, Alexandria. of Alexandria. So if you look it up on YouTube, Pentecostals of Alexandria. Just to listen to that every once in a while. Just put and, it on. Uh, Just put it on. And soak in that congregation. Remind you of the truth. Yes. Yes. The truth. You know, I, I'm looking. You know, you, I, I, I've watched that several times now, and, and it's, it's like. Powerful. It, it's it just powerful. It is. And, and, and it's not like all Such young people. And nothing wrong with young people. I used to be one. But you know, on the stage, there's the pastor. Yes. He looks like he could be my age. You notice that one time he just laid his hands on the yes. song leader. Yes. You know, let's, let's get her going some more. Yes. There, there was a, a, a bunch of those men who, yes. in their suits and everything, should have been very staid. But no, man, they're into worshiping God. Right. They're into worshiping. Oh, thank you. Scans across that. I don't know how many thousand are there. But, you know, most of the men have suits and ties, and, and it's, a very, it's, a very, uh, it's a very conservative church. I mean, all the women have, have uh, you know, ankle-length dresses on. That's who they are, the Pentecostals. You know, they, they don't need to be modern. They don't need to adapt to the culture. And there's something powerful about that, powerful about that. And, and, and even the men on the instruments, you know, it's like, just, yeah, the woman drummer, you know, it's like, she's good, you know, and, and, but, but what, what it seemed to me is all the, all the musicians were worshiping. They weren't just playing their instruments. They were worshiping with their instruments. And it's like, that's, in, in, the, midst, in the midst of all the bad things and negative things going on in our culture, that's going on. That's going on. I thought we ought to Maybe call them up and say, gee, uh, would you be open to having a group of us? We'll bring our whole church down. Your whole church? Yeah, all 40 of us. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come down and be part of that. But, but I encourage you to, to look that up and just listen to it. I mean, we sing that song once in a while here, but there's, that's, that's, that's just powerful. That's just powerful. And, and what it says is uh, God's moving. God's moving. And he, he knows what New England needs. We need that. You know, that's, that's what we need. And, and by the way, that's a denomination I might have mentioned. It's a denomination that's on the outs with most evangelicals. They don't toe the line doctrinally around some things that a lot of evangelicals don't like, but they sing their songs. A lot of, a lot of songs are coming out of that, that Pentecostal group that, that the church alienates and doesn't want to associate with, but they're singing their, they're singing their songs. They're singing them. Well, glory to God. Let's Bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Hallelujah. To the Waymaker. Hallelujah. Glory to you. All right. To the Waymaker. Yes. Father, according to your word and by faith, I honor you with my wealth and know that my barns are filled to overflowing. I have too much to store it all. I bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You have thrown open the floodgates of heaven. And poured out so, so much, much blessing that I do not have room enough, enough for it. Because I am a tither, according to Malachi 3.11, you have rebuked the devourer for me. That which comes to devour my health, devour my wealth, devour my soul, is rebuked for my sake. According to your word, I have been made rich in every way, so that I can be generous on every occasion. I give and I know it is given to me a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over is being poured into my lap. I sow generously, so I know I am reaping generously. I know that you have given me more than I need, so that I always have all I need, and more than enough for every good cause. I am a tither, and I am a cheerful giver, in, in the, the name, name of Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Waymaker. Just think, Yahweh's got his people all over the world. And 
he's got congregations like that that really know how to worship and get together and sing. Can you imagine when we all get to heaven? Amen. It's not going to be quiet. 500 million of us. <laughs> I mean, the heavenly choir will just start up. Do you know when was it? Uh, sometime this past month, the Levitical priests gathered at the... Uh, yep gathered on the steps at Temple Mount and sang the psalms of ascent. 2,000 years those songs have not been sung. Come on. They, they saw, they gathered who, those who are in the Levitical. They know who they are. Got them all together and they sang on the temple steps. Uh -huh. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us. We bring our tithes and offerings into the kingdom knowing that they're blessed. We sought our offerings to remind us that all that we give to you is well preserved and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, the God of Israel, the God of Yeshua, the God of this kingdom of God that is alive, Yahweh, our ruler, our king, who has brought us into his kingdom with a purpose to represent him. May that blessing of his pour forth into your life with an anointing such that you're not like you've ever been before. That you will hear words coming out of your mouth. You will feel feelings you've never felt before as you walk in the world suddenly with your head high knowing who you are, whose you are, that you're a son or daughter of the Most High God. And you will walk this week with purpose everywhere you go in the name of Yeshua. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Waymaker, miracle worker.